As some students in New England go back to classes, their future is very uncertain. I feel like without DACA, I'm going to be stuck again, um, not knowing what my future will actually look like. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankosky. We'll hear about the impact of the Trump administration's rescission of a program for undocumented young people. And we'll explore the impact of guns in a state where gun rights are precious. A lot of people have a safe and, and healthy relationship with firearms, and they're not this small slice of the population that so often dominates the conversation about guns. And here's an accent that might be familiar. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in the park. But researchers say that accent is fading. We'll take a listen. And we'll walk along a borderline that's been at the center of a lobster war with a border that's pretty fuzzy. There's some things the mind of man is not meant to know. And that line may be one of them. <laughs> and we'll meet some kids who spent their summer vacation in 1774. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Next. I'm John Dankosky. This week, we've been hearing the voices of young people around New England whose future is very uncertain. Some 15,000 immigrants in our region have been granted temporary status under the program known as DACA. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals allows young people whose parents brought them to this country illegally to live and work here. Now that program has been rescinded by the Trump administration, many elected officials have reacted sharply toward that decision, and four New England states have joined a lawsuit in support of DACA recipients. As reporter Shannon Dooling found, this news came at a difficult time for many students in the area. She went to the University of Massachusetts, Boston, on the first day of classes. Overall, it's a pretty festive environment. There are clusters of blue and white balloons and streamers welcoming students back to class. But for some students at UMass Boston, the question was just how long this college experience will last. Uh, so my first class went really great. I was super nervous. This is obviously my first year of college, my first semester. Uh, but it went great. I'm very excited for the class, even though I have to be there for over two hours. <laughs> Paula is 19 years old, the youngest of three sisters, all of whom are DACA recipients. Paula's mom brought the girls to the U.S. from El Salvador when they were all children. We agreed to use only her middle name because she fears for the security of her family. And Paula's first day of college was also the day the Trump administration announced the end of the program that got her there. She says she was trying to focus but found her mind drifting to the fate of DACA. I want to be able to make sure that I do good, at least for the time that I'm able to go to school. I'm taking a class right now, but I don't know if that's going to be the story in a year from now. This might be the only, the only year that I can go to school and actually be in a class with other students that look just like me, but that have other opportunities that I don't. For the vast majority of the, of the dreamers, there will be no other options. Greg Romanofsky is head of the New England chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. He says DACA recipients have never had a permanent status. Deferred action has always meant a temporary relief from potential deportation. And signing up for the program meant undocumented young people had to come out of the shadows. So that means now... They will be left completely exposed. All of their information um, is with the government right now. So the government has the option of actually enforcing their deportation orders or um, uh, initiating removal proceedings against them. But Massachusetts elected leaders are making it known that protecting DREAMers is a priority. State Attorney General Maura Healy says she's ready to sue the administration in order to defend DACA. She said in ending the program, President Trump ignored bipartisan appeals to keep it. There is too much at stake, too many lives hanging in the balance. We can't stand by and watch as our communities are targeted and our people are marginalized. A Department of Homeland Security memo details the decision. As of yesterday, the Trump administration will no longer accept new DACA applications. But recipients whose temporary status is scheduled to expire between now and March 5th are eligible for a two-year renewal. For those recipients whose temporary status is scheduled to end on or after March 6th, the expiration date is final. Massachusetts U.S. Senator Ed Markey calls Trump's decision a betrayal. This is heartbreaking. It is unjust, and it is just plain evil. We should not punish these young people who have no other home than the United States of America. 
The administration's wind-down of DACA gives Congress six months to pass legislation to protect DACA recipients moving forward. Markey says he has a little bit of hope that Republicans and Democrats might be able to come together. Critics have long argued that then-President Obama overstepped his authority in 2012 by establishing DACA in an executive order. Andrew Arthur is a resident fellow in law and policy for the Center for Immigration Studies. This was a a massive overreach by President Obama, didn't have the authority to do it. Only Congress has the ability to give immigration benefits to individuals. Back at UMass Boston, Paola says she's trying to stay optimistic, even while she's calculating an uncertain future. I feel like without DACA, I'm going to be stuck again. Um, not knowing what my future will actually look like, not knowing if it's better to stay here or just go back to where I came from and just start from zero again. Paula packed up her notebook and headed to her next class. That's Shannon Dooling of WBUR reporting. We'll continue to follow the story of DACA recipients here in New England. For many people in the state of Vermont, guns are a way of life. Unlike the more populous, more urban states in our region, Vermonters own guns at a higher rate and fiercely protect their gun rights. That means looser gun laws than in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, but also a higher rate of gun deaths than in those states. Vermont Public Radio wanted to look into the numbers behind this reality, and they found some surprising data and also some very harrowing personal stories. From 2011 to 2016, 420 people died from gunshot wounds in Vermont, and the overwhelming majority of those were suicides. Taylor Dobbs is a digital reporter at VPR, and he produced their reporting project, Gunshots. Also joining us is Matthew Miller, a professor of health sciences and epidemiology at Northeastern University and co-director of the Harvard Injury Control Research Center. I started by asking Taylor why they took on this project. Well, every time gun control was coming up in the state house or gun violence emerged in the news, the rhetoric around guns in Vermont was very often focused on national data or national news trends. And I think a lot of Vermonters know that the relationship that Vermont tends to have with firearms is a little bit different than the nation at large. And so what I was curious about and what caused us to request this data was what does this problem even look like in Vermont? Who's dying and and maybe what could be done to help keep each other safe? Early in this piece, you, you talk about the framing that you have for this conversation, a framing that's quite a bit different in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine than it is perhaps in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Um, one Vermonter uh, wrote recently that guns aren't scary in rural Vermont. They're just another tool that you learn to respect at a young age. It felt like there was a piece missing from the conversation. Um, you know, we have these gun deaths. There is gun violence in Vermont and everywhere. But that conversation often misses the other side, the context that this exists in, which is that a lot of people have a what they consider and is a safe and, and healthy relationship with firearms, and they're not this small slice of the population that so often dominates the conversation about guns. And so we really wanted to open it up and let those folks speak for themselves about the relationship that they as Vermonters have with firearms, whether that's good or bad or political or apolitical. We just kind of wanted to open up a conversation. And then also the reporting would bring out some of the stories of what happens when things go very wrong. What did you learn about how many Vermonters actually own firearms? This is kind of hard to pin down uh, in large part because there's a lot of resistance to any effort by the government or any centralized entity to tracking firearms. So no one really knows exactly how many guns there are in Vermont. But some studies using survey data and other things have found that it's about 45 percent of households have at least one firearm. The national average is closer to about 35 percent. So that's a substantial difference there. And that kind of shaped the reporting down the road because we started talking about suicide, which was a big part of the story, and um, access to firearms is a piece of that. And as we know, there's a relatively large stigma around suicide and mental health. So I think a lot of this is that people are dying, but the public doesn't necessarily know that there was a gun involved or that it was a suicide because of those stigmas. Dr. Miller, before we get specifically into what you study regarding guns and suicide, Do you pull anything away from that number, 420 gun deaths in a state where 
a larger portion of the population owns guns than is the national average? Vermont, and for that part, most rural, relatively rural states, if we're confining the conversation to the Northeast, we're talking about Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire, um, all have much higher suicide rates than the more urban states in the Northeast, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island. Um, And it's largely driven by higher rates of firearm suicide uh, because there are many more people per capita who live in homes with guns in rural areas than in urban areas. The In urban areas, you have much higher crime rates, lethal and non-lethal violence. And so you're going to have a greater contribution to the total number of firearm deaths from homicide in urban areas than you are in rural areas. So having 80 or even 90 percent of all firearm deaths being firearm suicides, where the other 10 percent is largely firearm homicides and a few firearm accidents, in rural areas is not not really unexpected. and and reflects the most likely cause of death from firearms in the home being suicide anywhere you live, but especially in rural areas. So talk more about those connections between firearms and suicides. Is is one of your findings that the easy availability of a gun in any household is something that would lead more readily to suicide in that household? Yeah, the evidence is overwhelming that the presence of a gun in a home, especially if it's stored unsafely, um, increases the risk of suicide dramatically, several fold, especially for um, for everyone in the household, not just the gun owner. So it's a risk that's assumed by the gun owner and unwittingly, I think, imposed on everyone else in the home. But um, the, the likelihood of death goes up two, three, four, five fold, depending on, on how the firearm is stored. It's especially uh, uh, it's especially strong risk factor for for children and young adults, um, even those without any evidence of mental illness. You've advocated for lethal means counseling as a way to reduce suicides in the U.S. What exactly does that mean in in relationship to firearms? It means that you let people who live in homes with guns know the actuarial uh, data and the empirical evidence that having a gun in the home is putting everyone at much higher risk and that if you have somebody who's going through a hard time whether it's uh, um, mental illness or substance abuse problems or just existential problems like losing a job or having um, a, a, a rough time in a relationship that the single most protective thing you can do for that person is to remove the guns from the home uh, it has an immediate effect, and it has a profound effect. Uh, and the data, the data are overwhelming. If you look within the Northeast uh, at, at Taylor's excellent work, and you then had him run a, 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 another set of articles on homicide rates, um, what, what, what you would see is that the greatest risk that the gun in the home imposes is on the risk of suicide. Uh, and that when you look in, in homes with with guns, the the likelihood of of a suicide death among every person in that home just goes up dramatically. So given these statistics, Taylor, 89% of the 420 gun deaths in your state from 2011 to 2016, which certainly lines up with some of the national work that Dr. Miller's done, what is Vermont doing about this? Are, are they reacting in any way to try to prevent suicide by firearms? Well, as I mentioned, politically, it's kind of a non-starter in Vermont. There's a very strong and rich history and culture of guns in Vermont. So when that comes up, it's really just it, it doesn't go anywhere. But without any legislation, there's, of course, things that people can and are doing. Um, our reporting, we talked to a woman at the VA who was talking about how Removing a gun from the home for a lot of veterans is just not going to happen. They believe that that's one of the rights that they fought for and they should be allowed to have a gun. And so the VA, in, in trying to prevent suicides, is, is trying to embrace other ways to mitigate that risk. And um, as Dr. Miller mentioned, safe storage is a huge part of that. Um, they always, you know, they say to keep it locked up, essentially put up as many barriers as you can to really rapid access to that gun. Um, Another tip, which I I thought was so striking from the VA, was 
that they say that veterans should keep a photo of a loved one next to where they keep their gun, um, which when you sort of think of, think about the situation that they're envisioning there, it's a really powerful one where somebody's at that at the end of their rope and, and that photo is what does it. Um, so really just finding ways to slow the process down a little bit so that they don't get to that point of making a decision that can't be taken back. John, can I, can I say something about that? Please do. So uh, Taylor captures nicely sort of the, 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 the way that most people think about veterans and, and their guns. Um, uh, and I completely agree with him. This is not, this is not a problem, firearm suicide, where we're going to legislate our way out of it. But um, I don't accept the, the notion that veterans who want to protect themselves and their family are incapable of removing the guns from their home, at least temporarily, when they or someone they love is going through uh, a, a, a difficult and volatile time. So the, and the VA has been at the vanguard of trying to communicate the, um, and empower veterans to do just that, to remove the gun if they can, and if they absolutely can't, to at least store it safely. Um, but we need to apply the sort of scientific rigor that went into demonstrating that a gun in the home increases the risk dramatically to now understanding how to communicate that risk to veterans and non-veterans in a way that allows them to act in their own enlightened self-interest. And um, those are the sorts of strategies that need to be funded um, so, that, so that people can make decisions based on sort of good information and the concern that they have for themselves or their loved ones. One of the things our reporting found in that same vein was that there's a, the state-designated mental health and substance abuse agency has outreach workers who go around the state and, you know, serve as caseworkers. And we, we found that they actually are driving around the state and carrying cable locks for guns so that when they encounter a family that has a gun in the house and maybe it's not stored safely, they just are giving those away to make it that much easier for safe, safe storage. And that same organization actually offers, f- I believe, free or discounted gun safes. And they say those go out the door as soon as they come in. They have shipments that come in and they go right back out to people on a waiting list for those. So there are measures in place that are working at having that conversation, educating people about the risks and actually doing something about that risk. But, the, you know, the question is, are, are we doing enough? And is there other are there other things that we could be doing to help bring down the risk even more. We've been talking a lot about the risk percentages and communicating that and also talking about data, raw numbers, both in Vermont and around the region and nationally. Taylor, of course, the best way to communicate with people is through individual stories sometimes. What are some of the stories that struck you that you pulled out of all this data you reported? Well, uh, there were a few. I mean, the death certificates, this is all based on death certificates that were released by the Vermont Department of Health. And they have a limited amount of information. It's uh, the circumstances of the death and then some details about the person who died. But some of those told a really powerful uh, story in the little snippets of information they had. I mean, the most striking one uh, that I still think about is there were a pair of death certificates. It was a husband and a wife, um, and he had died by suicide and she by homicide. Um, And on her death certificate, it said that she was married at the time she died. And on his, it said that he was widowed at the time he died. Um, And it ultimately became clear that this was a murder-suicide. But that small amount of detail carried through and told an incredibly wrenching uh, and powerful story. Um, And another thing that happened was after this uh, project came out and we people were going through it, a, a woman wrote in and said that she found her father's suicide in, in our data. Um, and she wrote a very profound sort of personal account of what that was like for her and what it was like to have to, you know, deal with the fact that his personal effects that the police had included this gun that he had used for that and uh, and how she went through that and dealt with it. And, it you know, it really, really drove home the point that you know, we're talking about data and percentages, and, and it, it turns into numbers a lot. But behind every one of those numbers is a story like that or, or many stories like that. Taylor Dobbs is the digital reporter at Vermont Public Radio, and he produced the reporting project Gunshots, 
Vermont Gun Deaths 2011 to 2016. We were also joined by Matthew Miller, a professor of health sciences and epidemiology at Northeastern University and co-director of the Harvard Injury Control Research Center. Reporters Annie Russell, Henry Epp, and Liam Elder Connors from VPR also contributed to this project. We've got links to all of their reporting and to the Vermont gun death data set that Taylor analyzed on our website. It's nextnewengland.org. Coming up, how New Englanders talk. It's wicked awesome. And it's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. The Netflix series Orange is the New Black features a woman with a kind of Boston accent. Actually, the character's way of talking is a little more complicated than that, and so is her story. Developing the sound brought actress E.L. Stone to Boston. There she met up with WBUR's Sarah Rose Brenner, who brings us the story. I love the beach, but I burn like a lobster, so I'm going to get a good swim shirt. And bonus, it's going to hide the gore blood That's Australian actress Yael Stone as Lorna Morello in season one. She's in prison for stalking a guy she met at the post office. They only had coffee once, but Lorna invented an entire love story between them, and she really believes it. Did she ever make an attempt on your life? Yes. We found a homemade explosive device under Angela's car. Oh, she's being so dramatic. They're twisting this whole story. You might not hear it, but Lorna Morello, the character, is from East Boston. Five years ago, early into filming of the first season... Yael Stone, the actress, took a quick trip to Boston to help her learn the character. I think it was two days, yeah. And I had my camera with me and I took some photos, which also I found really helpful. You know, I did I did find those areas imaginatively that I was like, oh, this is maybe what Lorna's childhood house looks like. In addition to photographs, Stone made audio recordings. And she used them to start piecing together a biography for her character. You know, two days is not a, not a lot, but it did help me collect a kind of visual audio bank to draw from. My voice and my accent are in that audio bank. On that trip to Boston five years ago, Stone and I met at a cafe, and she brought her recorder. <laughs> and they do, like, each week they choose one character to have, like, a, a backstory on it. Oh, cool. And you find out what, why they're in prison, basically. There's a beautiful part where, which I used to love listening to, where you're talking about, oh, I think you're talking about work and yeah, sports. Yeah, it's great, other than the fact that there's no hockey. So. It must have been around Christmas time because there's Christmas music in the background. I think it's, I, I blame it like solely on Jeremy Jacobs at this point. See, who's the, the Bruins on And it just has this like beautiful ethereal quality and, and it's like drifting away and you're talking with your beautiful accent and I, I used to love listening to that. Um, there was a few things I would listen to on the way to work. He's lost the second most games out of anyone. Second Stone listened to that recording and others to help perfect a hybrid Northeast sound. This is not my attempt at a Boston accent. I was also living in Brooklyn at the time, and it is a really Brooklyn sound. There are some parts of that sound, though, that do have Boston elements. So it's definitely a cocktail. And that cocktail reveals a lot about Lorna and her background. The sounds we make tell the story of our life sometimes. So for Lorna, the sounds that she makes tells the story of, of her life. So a life that's kind of moved up and down the, the East Coast, that she's very adaptable. She's done pretty well in prison because she has been flexible. She's managed to create allegiances that have kept her safe. Fisher never came to visit when she had Rosa. You know what she'd do? She'd bring me a heat bar and a cold Dr. Pepper at the end of the day. Isn't that thoughtful? Huh. Maybe you could do that when you come to check on me. Like Lorna, Stone says her own voice tells people a lot about who she is. I don't sound terribly Australian. People tell me that all the time. That tells a story of somebody who has gone to drama school, been made to feel a little ashamed of their Australian accent because, you know, we have a bit of cultural cringe in Australia. Um, So that already, that tells you something about me and my personality. So, you know, I think, you know, an accent can tell a big story. So the next time you're talking to someone or binging Netflix, listen closely. You might just learn something. 
That's Sarah Rose Brenner from WBUR reporting. All those dropped R's and long A's you just heard are, of course, part of not just the Boston sound, but that of much of New England. But in a 2012 study, our next guest found that the classic New England accent is actually receding. Dartmouth College linguist James Stanford has also used an online crowdsourcing tool to reach over 600 speakers around the region. This big data set allowed them to tease out some subtle differences in the way people from different parts of New England talk. James Stanford, welcome to Next. Thanks. I'm very glad to be here. I want to start by clarifying a bit of the terminology we're going to be using. We, we often talk about the accent that people have, but you use the term dialect. What's the difference? Yeah, we, we often use the term dialect just because it's a little more general. If we say dialect features, then we could be referring to the pronunciation, but it could also be referring to individual words or lexical items, as we call them, or even grammatical features. So we tend to just kind of generally say dialect features. And then if we're speaking specifically about pronunciation, we might say accent. Uh, we listened to a story about about what we know of as the Boston accent. It's sometimes thought of a, as a stand-in for New England's regional accent. So, so how much of the linguistic history here can be traced back to eastern Massachusetts? This is one of these situations in the U.S. where we can really use linguistics to kind of go back in time. It's like a time machine because we can trace many of the dialect patterns, if not the specific features, at least the dialect boundaries. Many of them can be traced all the way back to the colonial era. So we had a lot of settlers from Southeast England and East Anglia who settled in the Massachusetts Bay Area, you know, starting with 1620 with the Plymouth Bay Colony and then moving on. And those settlers, as England started to shift in various different pronunciation styles, the people that were in the eastern side, especially in the Massachusetts Bay Area, stayed in close contact with England, Southeast England. And so they kind of followed those features, whereas people that moved farther inland, such as in western Vermont or western Connecticut, they didn't get those features. And I think specifically of what we call R-lessness, which is when you drop your R, so like the pak the ka kind of sound. Southeast England shifted toward that pronunciation right around the time of the revolution. And so the settlers who were in the closest touch with the London area picked that up too. You work at Dartmouth College, uh, which is in Hanover, New Hampshire, and you drove across the Connecticut River to Vermont Public Radio Studios in Norwich, Vermont. So as you go across that river, are you going across a kind of a dividing line in the way that people talk in our region? Yeah, to some extent you are, and it's multidimensional because it has to do with age as well. But in some age groups, we found that that Connecticut River, the divide between Vermont and New Hampshire, is a boundary, especially in uh, kind of the senior citizens age groups right now. Back a generation earlier, the dividing line was in the Green Mountains. But what we're finding is that dividing line has moved over. And then for the youngest generation, it's pretty much wiped out. There's some subtle features left. But as far as dropping the R and some of the classic features here in northern New England, we're finding that say 20, 30-year-olds often don't have those features. And that's kind of what you expect as social patterns and social needs and goals in people's lives change over the generation. So first of all, why is that dividing line moving, do you think? It seems to be a combination of a number of factors, but primarily it's just more and more contact with regions outside of just the local region. So there's a great amount of uh, immigration into these areas from other states, from the cities. And then also you have there's the interstate system came about and more and more contact in that way. But what's interesting is it's not so much the contact between adults that matters. What matters is that you gradually get generations of kids who are starting to hear those features and incorporate them into their dialect. And also they're starting to have more of an outward orientation. We use that term to say maybe you're out in rural Vermont or rural New Hampshire, but you have an outward orientation, meaning that you're planning to go on and try to get a job in New York City or in Boston, whereas another person, similar age group, might be planning to continue on the family farm, and that kind of person might be more likely to retain the features. But even so, the younger generations in northern New England are seeing a, de a rapid decrease. In fact, we, we've drawn graphs where we put the, the age range along the horizontal axis and then put some kind of feature like dropping your R or um, changing the way you pronounce, so like the word father, the, the vowel in the father vowel. 
we've seen, we can map those out and just see generationally that they're dropping off up here in Northern England. Well, let's listen to some examples that you sent us. First, let's listen to a speaker from Newton, Massachusetts. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in the park. Steve tried to shout calmly, hey, I thought Mary paid for the boarding passes. Pat laughed and laughed at the merry sound of the shouting. What, what all do you hear in there before we, before we hear from someone in, in Middlebury, Vermont? What, what do you hear in that, in that uh, voice? Uh, so we, we did this online study where we asked people to read 12 sentences. And in those sentences, we deliberately put in a lot of words that would bring out some of these features. Yeah. So one thing is she's dropping the R's in words like boarding. There's also some vowels like you could see we had the word park in there so that you get the dropped R, but also she says pack. So if you were in in New York City, a traditional R-less New York accent's changing down there too, but a traditional accent in New York would have been pack, whereas up here it's more like pack. It's a, there's a little bit of a shift in the vowel, so she has that as well. And she also has a uh, fronted, we call it a fronted palm vowel, where the word palm or calm is pronounced a little bit more like that, whereas other people might say palm or calm. All right, so, so now, uh, by way of contrast, let's listen to a recording from Middlebury, Vermont. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in a park. Steve tried to shout calmly, Hey, I thought Mary paid for the boarding passes. Pat laughed and laughed at the merry sound of the shouting. Interesting. So, so uh, pick apart the differences there. Yeah, so this guy has a, a really nice uh, kind of a rural Vermont sound. Of course, Every state that we're talking about is an extremely diverse place with a wide range of people, and the, there's a, a large number of social factors that play a role. So it can be an issue of age and gender and education, and social class, and also even your personal identity. But just generally speaking, that type of style of speech uh, is going to reflect some of the some of the features in, in Vermont. Some of the diphthongs. So this is like a sound like like time, the I sound. There's a little change, so it's kind of more like time. And you also get that with the ow diphthongs. So one of the kind of classic uh, stereotypes or just kind of things, friendly things that people tease Vermonters about is saying cow like keo. I, I guess I'm wondering if you find that while these traditional accents are fading over time as younger generations take on more of a generic American accent, if there's some holding on to the past. Do you feel that, that, that people are trying to hold on to some of these old ways even a little bit? What we're finding is that for some of the most stigmatized, regionalized features, such as dropping your R or the Pak, the Khan, Havad sound, for those type of things, we find that the younger generation tend to be, we call it leveling, dialect leveling, where you, where you remove those features from your speech. But this is only the case in northern New England and in, say, the suburbs of the eastern Massachusetts area. We also spent time down in uh, some of the classic traditional dialect areas of Boston, such as Quincy and South Boston and uh, Dorchester. For people that are in their 20s or old, any age that we ran into in those kind of classic traditional dialect areas of urban Boston, these dialect features are alive and well. But yeah, but to answer your question, I think that it depends a lot on the identity that the person wants to express. So up here in northern New England, what we're finding is they don't want to uh, be associated with that old style of pronunciation, which, which to them sounds old-fashioned, or that it connects them to Boston. In fact, one of my colleagues has a paper called Live Free or Die as a Linguistic <laughs> Principle, <laughs> and she argues that New Hampshireites want to separate themselves from Boston and the whole Taxachusetts attitude down there. So they are actually intentionally avoiding those features. What we do find, though, is that especially in individual words, some of those words continue on. So one of the famous ones is to use the word wicked in front of an adjective, like wicked cold or, or stereotypically like wicked awesome. That style is more common over here in New England. It's something that people seem to take some pride in. There's also some uh, Rhode Island identity that comes out in the, in the term coffee milk, which is some kind of drink of milk mixed with coffee and sweetened syrup, which people from other parts of the country and even New England aren't aware of. But in our dialect maps, it showed up very strongly in Rhode Island. Actually, let's hear from a, a speaker from Rhode Island here, and maybe we can talk about that specific accent. Sue rode a tan horse to the farm. The horse likes to kick my foot. This old bus can easily carry the bean bags in the laundry bin. I guess that Sherry didn't bother to start my car or lock my bike. 
See, now what I hear there, but before I, I let you d- dissect that, is is the word foot, which she completely drops the T off of. I live in Connecticut, and I'm used to people dropping the T's completely off of things. This is, we call it a, a T glottalization, where the, the T is actually getting dropped in a way. A lot of us drop it a little bit, but in some of these speakers, it's dropped in a way that's that's very salient. One thing is that she dropped her R in some of the words that had an R, and that's what we'd expect for Rhode Island because it's on the eastern side. But there's an amazingly sharp boundary between Rhode Island and Massachusetts that's almost literally along the state boundary. And it appeared in our online study, this feature affects words like lot and thought. So if you think of the word C-O-T and the word C-A-U-G-H-T. I'd say caught and caught. You say I'm the same? I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking I'm saying them the same. I'm not sure that I am. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what happens is, is as you cross from Rhode Island into Massachusetts, we find that the people in the north part, so this is going to be all of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and the northeast part of Massachusetts, those areas most likely they pronounce them the same. So it's just caught and caught. Then in Rhode Island and Connecticut and western Massachusetts, they typically pronounce them differently. So it's like the the bed is like caught and then catching the ball is like caught. But So what's fascinating for linguists is to trace this because here's a case where it's being passed along from generation to generation. And as far as we know, when the original settlers came to New England, they pronounced these vowels differently. And then this is more of a recent thing, possibly in the last 150, 100 years or so in the northern part of England, they got merged together where those two words are pronounced the same. But what's fascinating, though, is that it's following that boundary that traces back to the 1630s of the the founding of Rhode Island. So even though those vowels wouldn't have been different in the 1630s, the groups of people and the established sociopolitical boundaries are there. And so these things continue on. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing some of these voices. James Stanford's Associate Professor of Linguistics at Dartmouth College. Uh, he joined us today from the studios of Vermont Public Radio in Norwich, Vermont. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. So are you proud of your accent? Maybe a little embarrassed? Or maybe you don't have any accent at all? At least you don't think you do. Tell us about it on Twitter, at Next New England. You can also use your phone's voice memo app to record a short message and email it to next at wnpr.org. Your voice might end up on a future episode. Coming up, fishermen in New Hampshire and Maine wage a border war over, well, what else? Lobster. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Melville Charitable Trust supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of housing and homelessness. Off the coast of New Hampshire are the iconic Isles of Shoals, and somewhere around the middle of those isles, there's an imaginary dotted line, the state border between New Hampshire and Maine. New Hampshire Public Radio's Jason Moon found out that that line has been the cause of some intense disagreement over the years. I'm standing on the island of Newcastle right now, looking out at where the Piscataqua River meets the Atlantic Ocean. Across the river in front of me, I can see the state of Maine. And if I look way out to sea, I can just make out the Isles of Shoals. Now, between me and Maine, I can also see two lighthouses. One of them is on the island here with me. The other is a bit further out to sea. That's the line we'd use, we'd probably use for a century or so you know, between the uh, New Hampshire and Maine fishermen. That's Jack Newick, a lifelong lobsterman from Dover. Newick says in the old days, if you were out at sea, all you had to do was imagine a straight line connecting those lighthouses, and that was the border. They called it the Lights On Range. To think that in 19, you know, the early 70s, certain borders hadn't been established yet. That's Roland Goodbody, an archivist at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. He says the Lights On Range had no legal basis. It was more of a gentleman's agreement. That agreement fell apart in the 1970s with what became known as the Lobster War. It seems to me, maybe I'm wrong about this, but it seems to me it could have been avoided entirely by Maine and New Hampshire agreeing on the same size lobster that you could catch. In the late 60s, concerns about overfishing had led both states to enact minimum size restrictions on lobstering. But their minimum sizes were different by one-sixteenth of an inch. So suddenly it mattered to state officials where lobstermen set their traps. Newick, the New Hampshire lobsterman, 
remembers how the lobster war began. For some reason, one particular Maine fisherman, he uh, he was a mean, ornery son of a gun. He called the uh, state of Maine down to establish a line. Maine game wardens responding to the call found a New Hampshire lobsterman named Ed Heafy with lobsters in his boat that were illegal in Maine. But Heafy, using the lights on range, said he wasn't in Maine, he was in New Hampshire. The wardens disagreed. Things escalated. Ed Heafy's shipmate, Brocky, had a loaded pistol. The wardens tried to board the boat. Eddie said, you're not going to take my boat away from me. And Brocky's going, okay, Ed, you take care of those two. I got these two right in my sights right now, no problem. Ultimately, no shots were fired that day, and Heafy went with the wardens. But when word of this standoff reached then-New Hampshire Governor Meldrum Thompson, the real action began. In 1973, Thompson had just taken office. He was, a, he was kind of a badass in a, in a really nice suit, you know? Candace Thompson, no relation, covered Mel Thompson for several newspapers in the 1970s. Here's a quick highlight reel. Thompson lobbied for the New Hampshire National Guard to have nuclear weapons. He replaced the word scenic on the state license plate with live free or die. When a man with religious objections covered that phrase on his license plate, Governor Thompson put him in jail. No liked a good fight. I mean, it was like, he didn't. He did, you know? He did. When this battle over state sovereignty broke out, Governor Thompson was quick to jump in. Anything, any dispute like this just kind of triggered this, this inner uh, compulsion of his. Tom Rath was an attorney in the Department of Justice under Thompson, He says in the long history of Thompson's fights, this one stands out. You know, if you take some of the cases, they are probably just to the south of crazy. But this doesn't fall in that, in my judgment. It was and remains a legitimate question. Thompson came out swinging. He sent his attorney general to personally defend the New Hampshire lobsterman, Ed Heafy, against the charges in a main court. In a speech, he called New Hampshire fishermen, quote, soldiers on an important battle line for the state. The dispute went to the Supreme Court, which passed it back to the states. And for all the tough talk, the two states did eventually agree, and they placed the border where it is today, north of the line claimed by Maine, but south of the lights on range. To New Hampshire fishermen like Newick, it felt like a betrayal. New Hampshire blew it, 1,700 acres. Some New Hampshire fishermen never stopped fighting. Harrison Workman, a lobsterman who went by the nickname Worky, spent the rest of his life in search of historical evidence to back New Hampshire's claim to the old line. He even traveled to England and spent nine days poring over colonial maps in the archives of the British Admiralty. Worky spoke to New Hampshire Public Television in 1982. The boundary means so much to me, see, that I, I just cannot give it up. And it, uh, a lot of people in Maine would wish I would, I suppose, but it I'll never give it up as long as there's a a ray of hope. There was new hope in 2000 when another border dispute arose and the states went back to the Supreme Court. This time, the argument was over the ownership of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. New Hampshire lawyers used Workey's maps and research to prepare their arguments. The court issued its ruling in 2001. 24 years ago, in a lobster fishing dispute between the two states, this court entered a consent judgment fixing the Maine, New Hampshire boundary in the coastal waters from Portsmouth. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, speaking for the court, said because of the way the two states settled the lobster war, New Hampshire was barred from making a claim on the shipyard. The state boundary was fixed. Except it might not be, or at least not entirely. Lobstermen will tell you there's good fishing on the far side of the Isles of Shoals. But after contacting half a dozen government agencies and consulting state statutes, The maps just aren't clear on where Maine's waters end and New Hampshire's begin out there, which raises the possibility of yet another border dispute between the states. I I guess we've learned to live with that. (laughs) Again, Tom Rapp. There's some things the mind of man is not meant to know, (laughs) and that line may be one of them. (laughs) One difference now, both states use the same minimum lobster size, three and a quarter inches. That's Jason Moon reporting. Now it's back to school time in New England, and in their What I Did This Summer essays, there are some Connecticut kids who might be writing about the week they spent in 1774. Each year, the Noah Webster House in West Hartford, the childhood home of the founder of the American Dictionary, holds Colonial Children's Camp. The program gives kids a taste of what daily life was like in Webster's time. 
Next, producer Andrew Moraskin paid a visit. When kids show up on the first day of camp, they're given new identities. Staff at the Noah Webster House assign the campers roles based on families who lived in the West Division of Hartford, what's now West Hartford, in the 1770s. And the kids look the part with girls wearing long dresses and bonnets and knee-length pants for the boys. When talking to me, they use their colonial names. My name is Mary, and I'm 19 years old. I'm Amos Bidwell, and I'm five years old. The campers range in age from 8 to 12. The characters they play are anywhere from 1 to 19 years old. My name is Teresa Merrill, and I'm really tricky and sly, and I play a lot of tricks on my family. More on Jerusha and her mischief later. For now, Let's make some candles. Down. One, two, three, up, and straighten it out. The more wax you get on them, the straighter they'll be. It'll just save a while. It'll take, yeah, it takes about 10 times or more to get the wax, to get them straight. The method involves dipping a stick suspended on strings into a pot of hot wax, and a lot of patience. The campers seemed to get a kick out of the very simple toys from the period. We head out to the front lawn on busy South Main Street for a demonstration. The kids grab wooden stilts and start clomping around the yard. Doing this in a dress is so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So would you do races with them? Um, maybe I think you walk around. I, I think you can walk around on them because they're really fun. What's this? So, so it's a hoop, um, a big hoop, like it goes up to my waist and you have a stick and you basically have to keep the hoop up and rolling with the stick by hitting it. Back inside, it's clear the campers realize that life in the 18th century wasn't just fun and games. Do you guys think you would have liked living in 1774? Yes and no, because school was easier, but you didn't get as much education. And fa the farm, everyone loves animals, but it's hard to do all of it. Yeah, I sort of want to live back then in that time period, and I also kind of like living in this one, because, for example, Back then, there was no medicine or anything to like prevent you from getting sick or stop sickness, so you usually die a lot earlier. But Nancy says she'd enjoy the colonial life because of the different ways you could spend your time. Making candles, like sewing, weaving, those stuff seem like they give you like um, like a hobby, and you can keep doing that without being really bored on a screen all day. And then I'll walk in the door yeah. and I'm like, oh my God, you're back. And everybody's like. At the end of the week, each camp family puts on a skit in front of their actual families. The Merrill family skit revolves around the antics of our trickster, Jerusha. While dinner is cooking, unbeknownst to her siblings, she switches out the soup pot for the chamber pot. Soon enough. The soup's ready. Yay. And then, <laughs> some jokes never get old. Where's the chamber pot? I don't know. <laughs> That's next producer Andrew Moraskin reporting. You can find photos of the kids at Colonial Children's Camp, and they are adorable, at our website, nextnewengland.org. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrew Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. The digital editor is Heather Brandon. She's leaving WNPR, but she's going to stay in the family. She's moving to New England Public Radio. We're glad to have you here, Heather. Production help this week from Betty Smith. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. Next is also on Twitter. The show is at Next New England, and I'm at John Dankosky. You can follow us and get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and it's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, 
and WNPR.